Welcome back, everybody. It's the Week in Review, and you're going to love what we got today. Somebody roll that beautiful intro. Digital Perspectives with Brad Kimes. Come on in. Welcome back to the show. We got Sam in the house from Caleb and Brown, baby. Sam, how are you doing today? Very well today. It's a nice summer's day in London, surprisingly. Usually it's not this good, even though it is summer. But um, how's your morning going? Yeah, I'm, I'm doing good. Yeah, London, you usually think of rain and fish and chips, right? I mean, that's... Yeah. <laughs> a lot of people drinking Guinness out in the street. It's yeah. a Friday. Even yeah. though it's a work day, they're already out. <laughs> now, I'll ask a very corny tourist question. How far are you from Big Ben? right <laughs> Oof, yeah the, london's very it's like a, a big town you know mm-hmm. like yeah, imagine like new york's just this like condensed city and it's all quite close by but london's just this massive town and i'm probably half an hour from it oh know? my and god I'm, That's I'm in, so yeah 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 and i'm in the city i'm in I'm in London, London. <laughs> Damn, I am like, that's that's shocking. Now, see, now there you go. All right, on to crypto. Enough with that, right? <laughs> I'll, I'll go down a whole rabbit hole and they'll be like, what is his video about? No, um, so look, we do have a lot of stuff that we need to touch on today. And some of those Very things much. I want to level set for us and the audience. Some people watch every day. Some people watch every two weeks, whatever. But we have a critical window in front of us, Sam, and I know that you know this too, and I want to get your thoughts on it. I'm thinking, look, we are waiting to see if there's going to be an appeal in the SEC versus Ripple case. Mm-hmm. And we know that they tried to do an interlocutory appeal during the summary judgment over the programmatic sales, which is secondary market sales. So will they appeal yes. that? I expect them to, to be honest with you. I want to get your thoughts. Then number two, we have the real USD launching and then possible legislation. Let's start with the case first, Sam. What are your thoughts? Geez, well, this is a very interesting one because, yes, it is looking like it's going to be very likely that they won't appeal. That's what everyone's hoping for. It's like it's, it's going down that route. But the SEC is you know, not very – one, it's not very transparent before you know, it, it goes down a path of um, – attacking a project and then two it's completely uh it, it, it rose all these curveballs at companies and also it, it does things never like never no one really expects as well so yes there's like a certain percentage chance that things will go well for xrp but at the end of the day it's the sec they just like do whatever they want sometimes and it can drag on and on and on so knowing that i think you know being an XRP is very, very important. And then with how long it's going to take, it's a good idea to even hedge certain strategies where, you know, we know the crypto space is going to be doing this throughout this year. We know the whole space is still watching XRP, but we know the whole space is going to go down a path of a growth phase eventually leading into a bull market. We want to be an XRP, XLM, XDC, that whole payment sector if things go well. But we also need to look into like... Uh, the other sectors in the space in case things do drag on. I think you, I think it's a great point because I know I have a, a wide portfolio. You know, I mean, I have an array of assets in my portfolio from this sector. And I love that you highlighted like the, you know, XLM, XRP, kind of XDC, that payment world kind mm-hmm. of, you know, tokens that are geared to serve inside the financial system for payment rails. Uh, talk about that for a second, if you could. Yeah, well, so XRP is very much like that top coin in that payment sector, and everyone's watching it like a hawk. And what this case will do, if XRP, for example, isn't deemed a security, Ripple itself is able to like accelerate its product offerings for different institutions, and then it instantly pretty much... You know, obviously, if that happens, XRP will have a lot of demand just based on general interest, you know, hoping it's going to do well. But there's actually a direct correlation with if Ripple succeeds, you then have XRP as this bridging currency having a lot of demand being pushed into it on the actual product side of things. Now, the biggest thing is that if that goes well, and I really hope it does go well, you're going to see a lot of that uh, ecosystem with, you know, as I mentioned, XLM, XDC, you know, even Quant and HBAR are somewhat part of that payment sector. And um, they 
similar to like if there's an Ethereum ETF or something good with happening with Ethereum, you get a lot of these ERC-20 tokens do well, a lot of tokens within that ecosystem do well, because it sets precedent. That's the biggest thing. And the correlation between XRP and XLM and these other tokens we've seen is, is quite high. So it's nice to be, you know, in these other projects as well, if you're wanting to be in this payment sector, especially when they're lower market cap coins and they actually don't require as much value being injected into the project to do well price wise. Absolutely. And, you know, there was something last night, well, or early evening yesterday that came through and it was Fred Rispoli from Hoddle Law and yeah. shout out to him. Uh, now, he had a case with the Ninth Circuit Court over Ethereum and pushing the SEC and forcing them to declare a judgment what did, what Ethereum was, a security or not, yes, right? Yes, yes, yes. Now, he's lost that case. However, he has revealed to the world, even in the loss of the case, which is still amazing because, you know, God bless him for the fight. And he pushed them on that issue, which they have tried to stay completely vague on. You know, I've, and I just shout out to Digital Asset Investor. He has made this point so well. And I want to make it here before I talk about the result of, of Fred's finding in this case. Everyone talks about, well, what is, what is XRP if it's used in the secondary market? What is XRP? The judge says it's not a security. What is XRP if it's used with uh, institutions? Well, those happen to be securities, right? And then they got fined $125 million. Now, how come no one has asked, what is Ethereum? <laughs> what is Ethereum? Well, that's what Fred Rispoli's done, right? And no one asked on the minutia, the mi minutia level, the minute details. Well, when Ethereum is sold to institutions, what are those, right? You know, just like they go down and drill down on, on, on XRP. But you don't hear that conversation happening because people don't know what the hell they're buying. That's the truth. <laughs> and the real truth here is, is that Fred Rispoli is a fighter for truth. And he may have lost that case, but he forced the SEC yesterday to put out a letter that says, don't worry about that ETF. We have not made our mind up what Ethereum is. <laughs> and My people goodness, need to know. Him. That's a big deal, right, Sam? I mean, it's hanging in the balance still, and people yeah, don't yeah. even know it. Exactly. There, there are a lot of moving parts happening at once. So you've got these individual cases. It's funny because, like, let's say... Coinbase was being you know, sued by the SEC and getting targeted. And at simultaneously, while the Bitcoin ETF that was approved was using Coinbase as its, you know, for, for custody as well, for certain custody uh, technology. And we're seeing that now with like, let's say Ethereum being targeted, Uniswap being targeted or Metamask being targeted while also having Ethereum ETF you know, brewing. So it's, it's never really a case where the court hearings happening are actually what these uh, legal parties are thinking as well. It's, it's very much like they, they target a specific project, but it doesn't mean that there's other, the other reasons at play. And there's, I think there's a bigger goal for the US when it comes to cryptocurrency. And we can get into that as well when it comes to Tether and other crypto, uh, other, other projects that are being targeted. Mm -hmm. And yeah, well, yeah. No, let me cut in real quick. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, to your point, there has been so many targeted projects, kind of, they go after this one, they go after that one, they go after this one, they go after that. And some people are like, what in the world is going on? You know, there's yeah, no rhyme yeah. or reason to it, right? And what's interesting is, is that all of this may lead to a reclassification of crypto. Just this past week, we saw an article come out recognizing that uh, the Federal Reserve and the U.S. Treasury are considering reclassifying crypto as currency. Well, you know, Sam, this is a major <laughs> move. Like if they classify broadly all things currency, yeah. this solves the problem of the arguments that we're talking about of how Ethereum's got in favor. It's not getting looked at. They're mm. refusing to give it a look. They're drilling down and suppressing XRP for years and years and years. This kind of imbalance, it doesn't match, right? So 
if you can come out and put one thing in place that now level sets for the entire space, this could in an instant solve the problems of is it or isn't it? And it's over. And we know what all yeah, of it is. And we know how to treat it. And if they do that, they're suggesting that cryptos would then fall with a currency designation directly under the Bank Secrecy Act. And if mm. that happens, that's how you get the banks to steal the crypto market away from the people who have it today. Yes, yes. And, and, and look at this. Like, look how the U.S. has been using its currency as almost like a weapon around the world. Yep. Now, what's happening here is that people are starting to discover that there's an alternative asset class that you can jump into that gives you sovereignty of your own wealth. And you're able to actually, similar to having gold in a safe, silver in a safe, you can have digital assets that you own and can you know, travel around the world, send around the world. And it's great. Now, what's happening is that the U.S. is putting its tentacles throughout the whole crypto space. And... You, know, you could even talk about how the tether itself is such a highly traded pair and it's the whole crypto space is almost dependent on tether but then if it's kind of like what's the weakest link in crypto right now and if they can target tether they can actually target the rest of the crypto space or if they can target xrp it could set it could set precedent for all these other cryptocurrencies but what we all need to remember is that it's a worldwide asset Look what happened when the U.S. pushed too far when it comes to the U.S. dollar being a weapon. And then we've got these BRICS nations coming together and creating an alternative. Oh. Now, what's going to happen, you know, with crypto when they push too far and then people are just going to be like, all right, screw it. Let's step outside of the U.S. and actually treat crypto like a worldwide asset as opposed to some uh, individual asset that's regulated in the U.S. You know what I mean? Oh, my God, do I ever. You, you made some great points inside of that. Let me get to this. Tether, you brought up Tether, right? So yes, 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 we don't know what's gonna happen to Tether. We watched it just get pushed outside of regulation to the EU and 27 nations in the EU said, no, nah, no, nah, fella, you don't fit here. <laughs> now, if we see that same thing happen with US legislation, which they're now saying they can get done by the end of the year, miraculously, right? You mm. know, they can get it done now. And if they do the same thing, you've just watched, if U.S. does the same thing the EU does, you've just watched Tether get shoved out of the two largest economies of the world. And yes, if that's yes. the case, it's because they truly saw Tether as a threat and they want to make sure it never has access to the liquidity of the two largest economies of the world again. And this way it can never challenge the dollar, digital or otherwise. So this is how you handicap something. It doesn't mean it may go away. It may continue to serve exotic, smaller markets. We don't know how far and how hard it'll get hit. But I do know that if I could cut the liquidity from the two largest economies out of it, I know at that point <laughs> it's dying a slow death. It's starting to die because people will start to lose confidence in it because they know they can't hold it. You're right. You know? Yeah, exactly. And, and you know what else is happening there? Uh, sorry, to, sorry to interject. No, go ahead. Uh, just a small point. Um, when it comes to how the, the BRICS nations rallied together leading up to the US, you know, really attacking currencies and whatnot, and um, well, using the US dollar as a weapon, the, what the BRICS nations have done is similar to what the whole crypto sphere is doing. That's right. Knowing that there's these looming risks that could really affect things. And what's great is that, you know, Back in the day, Tether was probably, you know, if Tether went down, you'd, you'd see some massive crashes. These days, you've got a lot of alternatives and a lot of alternatives being built just in case this happens. So already, you know, you've got like USDC is probably could be put into the same category as Tether when it comes to you know, if they do something to Tether, it will probably affect USDC. But this is when we get into these other stable coins, like even the XRP Ledger stable coin, like you can see exactly why they're doing this they know what's going to be playing out. And then you've got all these other um, more algorithmic based stable coins and you've got even uh, different nations creating other stable coins. Like we forget that there's other countries out there that also have a currency that you could peg to. <laughs> That's a hundred percent right. And, you know, coming back to Tether just for a second to wrap that point up and, and land that plane to move on to BRICS. Um, if they, if they get Tether under control by shoving it outside the regulatory environments of the two largest economies of the world as a start, then you really realize, to me, if, you, if we see that happen, we know that that's happening. That, and that, that is confirmation that we see what's going on to Tether mm -hmm. and it's being pushed out. If that's the case, then it confirms to me what ETFs are really about for Bitcoin and Ethereum. They're lifeboats. 
their new liquidity streams because they are going to kill Tether. And the way to keep Bitcoin alive, the way to keep Ethereum alive, the two biggest right now, is to set up ETFs. Now the liquidity to fuel Bitcoin and, and Ethereum is now coming from the investor rich high end client so far getting What's ready to a new open asset up to class, everybody. Isn't it? New asset, Old class, new asset class, class, right? Yeah. And you're pouring all that money into it to support it because you're about to rip Tether out of it where it gets its liquidity from. Yes, it's a really good point. You create a paper asset which allows for further you know, development and exactly. um it also achieves two things so it does exactly that where you can have like a bitcoin ethereum etf succeed it's similar to when they did like paper gold paper silver and all these different etfs there what it also does and this is when we look at the bigger picture politically and whatnot and when it comes to how the world you know is moving if uh when you create these etfs you ultimately create this like you, then you can then put in a barrier to get real bitcoin real ethereum or real assets mm -hmm. and then you are still in the financial system which is completely what does that control. barrier look like to you <laughs> give me an example of what you're saying now because is that an accredited investor barrier what what well, do you see good question where, where i'm getting at is that it's it's almost like if you want to be in bitcoin ethereum on a price level where you're trying to make money you know, you can go through these ETFs, but if you want to have sovereignty over your own wealth, you know, sorry, we're going to push that away. <laughs> it could and, happen, right? I mean, yeah, that, it could that, happen. Yeah. That's the thing. It's, a, it's like a sliding scale. We don't know how hard this way or how hard that way it'll happen. So it's good that we keep our parameters open to see. Now let's move into the point that you made, which is a huge point about bricks. Okay, so we literally <laughs> cover Tether and how we could be witnessing a rerouting of liquidity to keep those assets going and alive while they disable and disarm and reshape Tether. And at the same time, you could get rid of thousands and thousands of, of smaller cap cryptos because the only way into them is Tether. So if you suffocate that liquidity, they're gone. And that's the quickest way to remedy that market down to real assets that have use case and eliminate the rest of that crap market. Now, yes. looking at BRICS, I look at BRICS and the news comes out today. Sam, it says, Russia to launch two crypto exchanges and stable coins linked to the Chinese yuan and the BRICS currency, which wasn't supposed to come out till like 2030 or something. Yeah. What the hell is going on here? <laughs> and it's exactly it. what we're noticing in the crypto space is also what these other nations are noticing they can see how citizens within the us might be affected with certain things or citizens around the world will be affected by these changes so let's create an alternative so we can circumvent western control and circumvent uh those restrictions get that get put in place or those attacks that get you know fired at the crypto space so that's very exciting. So it looks as like there may be some type of, um, you know, yuan based stable coin potentially, and uh, also tying in with uh, BRICS nations. And I know when it comes to the XRP world, there's been a lot of talk, not yet specifically in the BRICS papers, but a lot of talk of oh, is XRP or Ripple's technology going to be used in the BRICS ecosystem. And, you know, if we're, if we're jumping into BRICS and stable coins, we're getting closer to, oh, maybe there's a, there's some uh, other stuff going on there, which is exciting. It is. Look, and I mean, we have spent time on this channel showing, you know, BRICS, obviously acronym for Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, and many others have joined since as well. And we have direct or in connections to Ripple and XRP with every single one of them. And it's remarkable to see how that'll play out as you're pointing to. And one of the things that's, that, that uh, I find interesting here is that I come back to the notion that the XRP ledger serves as a decentralized exchange. And for people that don't understand that idea, picture the New York Stock Exchange, the CME Group, the NASDAQ, the Hong Kong Exchange, and every other exchange around the world, the German Exchange, every other exchange around the world tied into one massive exchange on the back end. Yeah. And it's serving liquidity to all of those markets and with the introduction of XRP as a bridge currency, you can start to make long tail pairings on the back of this deep liquidity that's been connected together in ways that we've never been able to cross over and make these path findings. 
because it's not been available before in the history of mankind. Mm -hmm. This technology exists now. It works. We've used it. We know it's time to roll it out. What I see happening geopolitically is allowing for this opportunity to introduce new money inside the system that serves as a bridge asset like XRP. Are you seeing this or no? Yes, correct. Well, with it's it obviously originally started with Ripple and then XRP, and that's pretty much it. Now it's actually developing into something that, oh, well, it, it could actually help not only cross-border payments, but actually help you know, create these different decentralized exchanges. And decentralized exchanges exist at the moment. However, to build on them requires extreme, yeah, there's a lot of developing required. There's a lot of smart contracts that need to be built. Apparently, and I saw this recently, uh, that even a, a, an ex-Ethereum, the Solidity Dev has been trialing out what they're doing with the XRP ledger and, and the, the uh, smart contracts that, that the uh, decentralized exchange that they're having and the actual ability to build platform like projects on the actual XRP ledger. He said it's a lot easier and a lot better to use. And it seems as like they're putting a lot of effort into that. So that's even like another box of frogs that's going to be thrown on top of... Uh, this it's really XRP true, ecosystem. and then we're going to see eventually an XRP ETF, I believe, as well, and that's going to set things on fire. You're really talking about total value locked up, right? You know, whether it's an ETF or whether you're participating in an XRP ledger automated market maker, you're really talking about more and more of the asset being locked up so it can help serve the network. I, I you know, it, it's a super exciting time, and I just want to point out too that. Along with that BRICS news, don't forget that the Monetary Authority of Singapore, along with the BIS and Deutsche Bank, are working with Axelar for the interoperability to connect all of these financial systems together. So That's very cool. That's very yeah. cool because that is a Ripple partner right there. And I believe that all that interoperability that Axelar is serving to bring together and coalesce is going to tie right into the XRP ledger for the exchange. And that's AXLR, isn't it? Yes. Yes, and we, we trade that as well without issue. And um, a lot of these projects have been gaining a lot more popularity over this year. And one thing I'd, I'd like to mention, while this is all happening, we're talking about XRP right now. We're talking about this, like everyone's got eyes on what's happening with the SEC, what's happening with the XRP ledger and whatnot. And we know things may go well there. Now, simultaneously, we've got a bit of a timeline and a ticking timeline. We're getting closer and closer to an end of a bear market. It's been an extended bear market. And hopefully what's happening with XRP can time itself with those macro events and with that four-year cycle that the general cryptocurrency space has. And then with the election period, hopefully it goes, goes well there. <laughs> That's another topic. And um, now, uh, but... While that's happening, let's say if the, uh, there is a bit of a delay, what we've seen in previous cycles is XRP does run its own course sometimes. It can act early. It can stay strong while other cryptocurrencies are going down. It can you know, be one of the latest, last movers in the space. Now, what we can do is have, if you're in the crypto space and you're wanting to capitalize on this whole entire asset class, is you have your bags betting on that and you're know, hoping for and watch it very closely as we're all doing and then look into you know even when it comes to what bitcoin ethereum's etfs and that the capital being injected there that will trickle into altcoins as well potentially later on and then you'll see a lot of these other DeFi project protocols do quite well and and that's what i'm here to discuss with clients when they sign up also you know investing in your xrp xlm and all these different payment sector projects and then strategizing on the you know, implementing of you know, US dollars in, or, or like buying of these projects and then the strategy in the next couple of years ahead. And um, But I'm also here to help with any hedging to let's say it does take a while and it does get extended again and you miss out on what's going to happen in, in the usual crypto space that we see every four years. Absolutely. So, Sam, tell everybody where they can find you at Caleb and Brown. Good question. So if you search up Caleb and Brown, I'm sure there'll be a link in the in the video as well. That's Caleb with a C and Brown dot com. You can sign up there. You know, mention uh, mention uh, Brad, mention Digital Perspectives. And um, from there, 
the good thing is we do everything an exchange can do. We can buy, sell, and swap crypto. We can set targets. We can do stop limit orders in a bull run. It's very exciting. But you have someone, no matter what stage you are, whether you're signing up, whether you're strategizing with me, for example, or whether you're putting through an order, there's always people behind that that care. So if you're putting through a trade, it's not just this like order book exchange, you know, market makers and takers and, and price impact every time you buy or sell and you get dicked with different you know, hidden fees. And it, it, we actually have physical traders that massage your order. And sometimes if it's a large order, incrementally do it to avoid that price impact. Now, and then if you're withdrawing or if you're depositing, you've got people there as well. So it's going to be very exciting. And um, once you sign up, once you're through the door, you work with a broker and then you're able to have these discussions and then uh, strategize the, the year ahead. That's wonderful. Make sure you check them out. It's Caleb and Brown and tell them that I sent you. Said, tell them I said, come <laughs> on in. Sam, thank you so much, man. Don't go anywhere. And happy Friday to everybody out there. Thank you so much, Brad. Thank you.